because it's all about him. It's all about worshiping him, exalting him. And he made it very clear, whatever you do, do to the glory of God. And let's stand together as we pray our worship prayer together on your overhead and also on the back of your bulletin as well. And let's pray it together unto the Lord. Lord God, as we enter your sanctuary with praise for Jesus, born of a virgin, to take away the sins of the world. Lord God, we praise you for giving your one and only Son in order that we can have his life of joy, peace, and happiness. Lord Jesus, we praise you for coming into the world and dying on the cross out of your abundant love for us. In Christ we pray. Amen. You may be seated. sacrifice. And Holy Spirit, we pray you move in this service. We give this service to you. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. And I'm so glad to have you here with us. I know we're going to be singing one of Doug's favorite songs, I'll Fly Away. We'll be doing our fellowship nod, wave, whatever you want to do, the, the queen wave, however you want to look at it. So we've got I'll Fly Away, so let's sing this song.
singing that song for a long time. I know it's been around a long time, but I never get tired of singing that song because one day we are going to fly away. And the world needs to hear that. They need to know our God reigns. They need to know who we, they need to know who Jesus is. Because for us as Christians to assume that there's people out there that everybody knows about Jesus, we are so wrong about that. We've got bus fulls of kids that come that don't know half the stuff that you were raised up knowing. And that's what we're here for still. Because if we didn't have a purpose, God would come back and get us. But we still have the, the harvest is still out there, and that's what we need to be doing. And I'm just so thankful for this church that puts into our children. They put into the getting the gospel out, but, but there's still a world out there that needs to hear about Jesus. And I'm so thankful uh, to be a part of this church family. Does anybody have a birthday or an anniversary they'd like to come up? I know that I've seen some. I don't know if, if they're here this morning, birthdays or anniversaries. Nobody wants to come up? Nobody here? Going once, going twice? Okay, well before Brother Benny comes, I have a card on Brother Benny's behalf that I'm going to share. Just a thank you so much card for during the loss of his father. The world, the world's a whole lot better place because of people like you who bring so much happiness with the nice things that they do. And with your recent thoughtfulness still very much in mind, this is meant to bring a thank you of the very warmest kind. Church family, thank you for your many expressions of love during my dad's sickness and home going. You are an amazing church family. Thank you for the beautiful wreath. It is truly beautiful. God's blessings to you, Brother Benny, Charlotte, and family. And I know we're so appreciative of Brother Benny, but still be praying for him and his family. I know it's a tough time, but there's so many people out there that are grieving the loss of, of loved ones. But, but uh, we definitely want to keep our pastor in our thoughts and prayers. But Brother Benny, you can come. Thank you, Byron, for sharing that. And uh, Dad's words ring in my ear. I've been ready a long time. And so I know he's at home. Aren't you glad to know we've got a heaven to go to? Amen. And as you get a little bit older along the way, you wonder what's it going to be like and when you arrive on the scenes of glory. Well, let's say our verse to remember found in 1 Corinthians 9, 24. You see it on the overhead and let's say it like you're saying it unto the Lord personally. And let's say it together out loud. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Know you not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. Oh, what a powerful verse that God used the Apostle Paul to pen. Let me remind you, next Sunday night is our election of officers and teachers for the new year. You do have an insert in your bulletin to fill out. Uh, this will be the last Sunday. The nominating committee will meet Wednesday night about 5.30. And nominating committee, you'll be getting an email uh, letting you know a little bit more about that. But if you would, please go ahead and fill out. Thank you for those who said, I'll step up. I'll serve in an area. I'm willing to help. And by the way, we're needing more and more and more help. Uh, for Sunday night, Wednesday night. And men, I'm going to call on some of you, and you're going to sit a little bit later, to uh, be mentoring men to our kids on Wednesday night and Sunday night. You don't have to teach a lesson, prepare a lesson, but I'm going to ask some of you men just to be there, be present, and you're going to put your name down on the dotted line so you know what, you can count on me to just be beside these little boys, show them what a real man is like. 
showing that a man is in church, loves kids, and, and they'll never forget you. So you're going to see more about this, and you'll see an insert from me. It'll be mentoring men because that's what it's about, mentoring and being that loving influence to our kids. Also on the overhead, don't forget September the 11th, uh, 50s plus potluck in the Fellowship Hall, and so look forward to getting back on track with these. It's been a while since we've been able to do that, but I, I'm looking forward to that, and I know you are too. Also, the Kaufmans, if you have never uh, had opportunity to hear the Kaufmans, they've been here for the last few years, but they're going to be uh, here in concert Sunday morning, September the 19th, as we've done it in the past, from 10.30 to 11 will be a short mini concert, and they'll be singing during the morning worship, so look forward to them coming as well. And also, Hunter Hills, if you still have not brought zip binders, you can contribute. Uh, we'll get them over there. All you need to do is bring them. I know that there's been challenges of getting them, but Hunter Hills have been deeply, deeply appreciative of all of those that uh, we have brought. So thank you in advance. And again, uh, please complete the form in the, uh, uh, in the bulletin that lets us know. So we will need, this will be the last Sunday. So thank you for doing that. Uh, someone uh, made a very accurate observation you know, we've far done far more than 101 homes, but that was what we did this past time. 101 homes, 63 contacts. But do you realize that we've done probably about 400 homes that we've reached in American Greeting? Where you as a church family have gone out, knocked on doors, left a gospel presence, a gospel witness. And that's one of the reasons that uh, some of the parents will say, you know what? I want my child, I want my children to be involved in a youth program, I, and uh, that's what we do. We do what we can, make the most impact in what time the parents give us to their children. By the way, I want to thank all of those who helped yesterday in uh, the Back to School Bash, and, and if you help, would you just raise your hand? All right, we had different ones all over, and I know Byron ran the bus and uh, saw some pictures. Thank you so very, very much. And The pictures, if you've not seen them, they're they're worth looking at because impacting and influencing children. They need it. They want it. They just don't know how to say it. They don't know how to say, I want somebody to look up to. I want a man that's really a man because you know what? They'll remember you. So uh, appreciate all of those. And uh, also Bible release uh, is coming in September. It's going to be the second uh, Tuesday of the month and be at 1 o'clock. And uh, so we'll be having... The uh, uh, Bible release program, we'll, they'll be bused here at 1. They'll be going back at 2, so we'll share more about that. And Bible release team, we will have a more concentrated meeting closer to that time. So just want to remind you of that. And uh, don't forget uh, our homebound who are listed in the bulletin. And uh, there's so many uh, needs and there's so many prayer concerns and prayer needs. And also, don't forget uh, all of those who are named on the back. You see the names on our prayer list. Please, please don't forget to lift them to the Father in prayer. And we want to take time to go to the Lord in prayer, but maybe you have a prayer request by the uplifted hand. We'll take prayer requests at the end. All right, all over, all over. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and lift all of these to the Father. Father, as we bow before you, you see every hand that's raised. You see every hand that represents a heart, represents concerns and needs. And so, dear Father, we pray for them. We thank you that you're a loving, good, and caring God. And we just ask your hand to overshadow all of those that have been represented. Father, for all of these that are named and listed on our prayer list, from the very first to the very last, we pray for them, their, their need. You know every need. You know every concern. And so, Father, we just ask you to minister. Physical illnesses. Some, Father, in our church family who are getting ready to say goodbye to a loved one. Father, we pray for them. Those who are going through times of grief. Those who are going through heartache. Those who are going through decision-making processes. We pray for them. Major decisions they're having to make in their life. Help them by your mighty power. And we thank you, dear Lord. For hearing and answering. In Jesus we pray. Amen. This time we'd like to ask our ushers to come and receive our tithes and offerings. Terry Sinners, Joe Fields.
Jacob Frazier, Mike Mills, Alan Sullivan, and Dan Rice. Brother Alan, would you lead us in prayer? Stand together. Well, as we're taking up the offering after this song, the choir and children's church will be dismissed. Page 514. invite you to get your Bibles out and turn with me to Matthew chapter 25, verses 15 through 23. We're going to look at it in just a moment. And let me ask you a question while you're taking your Bible and opening it. Have you ever stopped to think how utterly serious your life is to God? Have you ever stopped to think how serious every day of your life is, not only to you, but to the Lord God of heaven? You know, it's amazing how many people will live their life and maybe they place their faith in Jesus Christ as a child and they know that they're going to go to heaven when they die. But after they get saved, they do very little when it comes to honoring and glorifying the Lord. They're not uh, willing to work. They're not willing to serve. And yet the time comes on down the road, we're all going to leave this world and we're going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to call us into account of how we have used our life, our time, our energies, our talents, what we have done with this one God-given life. You know, there are so many people who live believing that after you're saved, that's all there is to it. It really doesn't matter after you get saved. It's over. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. So my life is my business, right? Dead wrong. As a matter of fact, Jesus makes it very clear in the message that we're going to look at this morning it is totally possible to gain reward and it's totally possible to lose reward. 
Someday on God's appointed calendar, you're going to be called personally, deliberately, and intentionally before the Lord Jesus Christ himself. I sort of shudder when I think I'm literally going to stand visibly before Jesus Christ, the righteous one. I'm going to be called and I'm going to give an account of every aspect of my redeemed life. How do I know that? Because the Bible makes it very clear. Jesus says in Revelation 22:12, 12, and behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Now, every man from the beginning of time to the end of time is going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. Some are going to stand in the judgment seat of Christ reserved for the righteous and some are going to stand in the great white throne judgment, but every person is going to stand. But I want to deal specifically in this part of the series that we're in, God's plan to reward, I want to deal with the aspect of gaining rewards. Have you ever stopped to think about it for a moment? That there is the capability for you to gain reward when you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, or it's totally possible for you to lose reward when you stand before the Lord himself. Now, let me just give you a comparison before I read the text of scripture. You know, every one of us uh, came into this world someplace, sometime, someday, somewhere, and you grew up, and maybe as you grew up, you say, you know what? I don't wanna just settle for what mom and dad has. I wanna get a job, I wanna go to work. Maybe you just didn't work a little bit, you worked a lot. And you did those things on this earth that were necessary to get ahead. Maybe you worked extra hours and you did all that you could. Maybe you used investment opportunities and you invested and your money kept accumulating. And uh, as you got a little bit older, you started thinking, wow, how I've been blessed. You've not just been blessed just by getting up on a regular basis, but you've been blessed because you were industrious. I want you to listen carefully. I want you to listen prayerfully because this is a serious message you need to hear because everyone that's redeemed of God is going to give account. And in this text of scripture, you have three men, two gained and one lost. And I want you to listen. And unto one, verse 15, and unto one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to every man according to his several ability. And straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of these servants cometh and reckon with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, listen carefully, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou the joy of thy Lord. Now I want to look at these two servants this morning because these are the two servants that gain. Uh, the other one I'll say for another time because you and I need to understand this one life matters and it matters greatly to both God and it ought to matter greatly to you. Because you stop and think, every second is ticking. Every moment time is going by, you're getting closer to the end of your life and you're getting closer to that day, that time when you will stand personally before Jesus Christ himself. You need to get it in your mind because you and I are going to stand. And so with that in mind, I want to deal with in this message, how in the world do you gain? Because, uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there that they're just living their Christian life, and, or at least they say they are. They're not really doing anything for God. They're not really doing anything for the glory of God. Oh, they're not going out killing anybody or stealing. 
They're just living a daily moral life, but they're not really using their life to bring glory and honor to God. I'm telling you this, and I want you to listen. It is going to happen. Jesus in this text of scripture gives uh, two, two pictures. He gives the picture of those who gain and the one who lost. Now, in the text of Scripture, you remember that Jesus is on the Mount of Olives. This is almost at the very end of his Olivet Discourse. So he's making it very clear that the time is coming when he's going to have them stand before him. And so with that in mind, I want to deal with this morning, how can you gain reward? Now, if you believe that you're saved by the grace of God and all you do is just live your life and then you die and breathe your last breath, and you don't really need to be involved, you don't need to do anything, you need to go back to the Bible and reread it. Jesus talks about these two men, and he mentioned them very faithfully, very honorably. They, one had two, one had five, but both of them were intentional in their effort. So I want you to listen carefully, and I want you to listen prayerfully, and I want you to follow along in your outline. So first of all, if I'm going to gain, when it comes time for me to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, what do I need to do? Well, it's interesting in the text what these men did because the first thing is they viewed themselves as a servant. If you're going to gain in the judgment, here's what you and I need to do. We need to view ourselves as servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, literally the Greek word in the Bible used for servant carries with it the idea of a slave. Now, we don't like to use that word slave because it brings back a lot of images and imagery from uh, the history of our country. But the reality of it is that's a different word. It's a different concept than in the Greek culture. As a matter of fact, it was not uncommon in the days of our Lord for persons to be bought and sold. And uh, there were some who really enjoyed their master. As a matter of fact, they, they wanted to stay with their master, so they'd go to the, uh, to the door frame and they'd put their ear on the door and they'd be branded as the possession of that master for the rest of their life. Listen, the slaves in Jesus' time, they had no rights of their own. As a matter of fact, these two men called themselves servants. And uh, when you look in the text of Scripture, the Bible makes it very clear that they viewed themselves. Now, why is that so important? Because here's the reality of a biblical servant. A biblical servant doesn't have any rights of his own. We are owned by our master. We're bought with a price. Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ owns you? If you're a child of God, that means he's got to take you home someday. He's got to bring you up and bring you to glory. As a matter of fact, Paul, in the opening words of, of, of Romans, he says, Paul, a servant. Literally, it's a bond slave. And Paul saw himself as a servant of Jesus Christ. You know what happens when you view yourself as a servant? Life gets real simple, real quick. First of all, you don't have an agenda of your own. Yours becomes the agenda of the Lord Jesus. Now let me show you how people get wealthy on this earth. You know it just as simple as I do, but let me show you what happens. Here's a person, they may not have a whole lot of money, but here's what they do. They look around them and they think, how on earth do you make money? So they maybe start saving money, they work extra shifts, they invest money, they do it in those things that they see on earth where they can gain money. Uh, I think it was Warren Buffett said that he was anxious to buy his first stock I believe at the age of eight, nine, or ten, something like that, he said he wanted to get in the stock market. Now, if anybody would say, is Warren Buffett rich earthwise? You'd say, absolutely. Why is he rich earthwise? Because he has done those things that on earth, watch this, make him rich. Now, if you want to ask him what his diet is in the morning, well, I can tell you what he does in the morning. He goes by McDonald's and he gets him a, I think it's an Egg McMuffin or a sausage biscuit. He, he likes that just basic lifestyle. He drives the car he's had for years, according to a documentary that I briefly saw. But he has done those things, watch this, on the earth that matter for earthly treasure. If you and I are going to be rich toward God, the first thing that must take place in the text of Scripture, you need to view yourself as a servant. Why? Because, listen, isn't it going to matter what you do for Jesus Christ for all of eternity? Amen? You can say, well, you know what? I didn't want to get involved in... Listen, every ministry we've got ought to be done to the glory of God and I believe is done to the glory of God. Why? Because lives matter. These children matter. Our Sunday school matters. Why? To learn and grow in the grace of God. 
As a matter of fact, Paul made it very clear to the Corinthian church. He said, you're bought. Now, if you don't want to do what the Lord says, just remember this. You don't own yourself. If you don't want to do what the Lord says, just remember this. There was a day and a time that he bought you. Listen to what the Bible says. For you're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. That should take care of a lot of discussion and a lot of debate. Well, now, I want to do this and I want to do that. Does it glorify God? Because you're going to give account of it. Listen very carefully. What if the Lord calls me into account? Benny, you never told the people how to gain reward. Listen, after this message today, you're going to know how to gain reward, and it's going to be on you. Because you're going to know very carefully, very deliberately, very intentionally how you can gain, and it's up to you what you do with the principles of this message. And God says you're bought with a price. Now imagine if I went over, and I'll just pick on Brother Byron because he's right here close. But let's suppose I went over to Brother Byron's uh, property and I just started building a house myself. I got some lumber and I had it delivered over there and, and uh, I said, uh, I started building. And one day he came down and I had a footer uh, poured and I, he came out to me and said, Brother Benny, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm building a house. He said, Brother Benny, why? I just wanted to. And he said, Brother Benny, you're missing one thing. I said, what, I've got the lumber, I've had the footer dug, I mean, I've got the concrete, I've had it. This is my property. You don't have a right to build your house on my property. You don't have a right to build and erect what you want on my property. Well, I want to build my house. Brother Benny, you don't have a right. It's my property. Do you get the picture? I don't have a right to do with me what I want to do with me for the flesh. I belong to Jesus Christ. And if you're redeemed, so do you. You have been bought. And the reality of it is if you're bought, you are commanded by your Lord and you're going to be called to give an account of the deeds done in your body. I wonder how many is going to have to give account of all the negativism that they put on social media and run people down and yet they name the name of Christ. These men got to work. You know why? Because their Lord called them and they viewed themselves as slaves. You say, well, now what really matters? Well, let me tell you some things that matter to the glory of God. You say, well, I can't win a soul to Jesus Christ. That's not your business. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen? I can't save a soul, neither can you. But can I tell you what does matter for eternity? When our service is dedicated to the glory of God. When you do it for Him, there's going to be gain. When we do the slightest thing to honor God, we gain. Matter of fact, Jesus said if you give a cup of cold water, it's going to be gain. When our motives are to honor God, you're sitting here this morning, you say, I want to listen, I want to learn, I want to grow in the Lord. Listen, that's a God-honoring motive, is it not? Amen? You're sitting here, you say, I'm, I'm trying to take the message in. I've got a pencil and a piece of paper. Your motive is to honor God, you're going to gain. When you sing to please God, listen, not try to outsing somebody else. When you sing to bring glory to God, that's gain. When we work and serve the Lord with all of our heart, do you realize God never said we're going to be successful, but He's going to watch our work? <coughs> Noah could not have pastored the church today, he didn't have that many converts. But God said he was a man who found favor with God. Do you find favor with God? Does God look at your life and he looks on your life with favor? Now listen to me very carefully. I recognize that there's times of vacation and need to get away. But we're growing more and more in the climate that church has become a byproduct or, or something I do on the side. Do you realize Jesus, it wasn't a byproduct for Jesus. And it makes it very clear. View yourself as a servant. Well, number two, what happens? Take Jesus' word seriously. Now, I want you to notice in the text that the Lord of these servants went away. Do you know what that's a biblical picture of? Jesus is using the parable to show he's the Lord and he's gone away. He went away back into a far country representing the fact that he's gone back into heaven. And he's gone for a season of time. How many years is he going to be gone back into heaven? I don't know, but he is coming back. 
As a matter of fact, you can find out exactly how he's going to come back, the way he's going to come back, where he's going to come back, what's going to happen when he comes back. You'll find out part of that tonight. But here's what happened to these men. These two men that rewarded, notice what they did. They took their master at his word. How do you know that? Because he told them. He gave them those talents and he told them to get to work. They took what their Lord had placed in their hands and they did that which honored God. Now let me show you. You've been given a gift by God. You've been given something to use. Something to use to honor God. And when you do it, whether it's singing, whether it's teaching, whatever it may be, it's going to be gain to you. And you see, listen to what again the Bible says in that same verse I read just a few moments ago. Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me, listen, to give every man. And that includes women. If you don't believe Jesus is going to reward you, then you may as well just call Jesus a liar. Well, I just don't know if I believe it. Then call him a liar. He is going to do what he says. If he's not going to do what he says, why do we believe the word? Because everything he says is going to happen. But see, one of the areas that we do, we sort of get scared. And we say, well, now I just hope what you say is not going to happen. I'm here to tell you, it is going to happen. And, uh, and the reality of it is, here's what happens. That person who treats God's word casually and, and sort of nonchalantly says, well, that's a nice verse. I, I like that verse. It makes for good reading. But their life don't adjust in it. Listen carefully. When you realize that you're going to be called before Jesus Christ and you're going to listen Listen, listen, you are going to look Jesus Christ in the eye person to person. It actually is, it makes a lot of difference the way you live your life. We must all appear before him. I'm going to appear. And that's why I'm very careful in what I say and how I say what I say. Because I want to say accurately, truthfully, and don't want to have any error. And, and the casual believer, they don't believe God's word. You know how I know that? They don't take anything seriously. They can say, I'll take it or leave it, and it's not reflected in their life. They're here today, gone tomorrow, here today, gone tomorrow, here today, and you can't count on them to do anything faithfully. Do you know why we evaluate on a yearly basis? Because we want to find, watch this, faithful people. It's a sad reality when there's people who come into classes and there's nobody there to teach them. It's a sad commentary when there's little lives and, and there's no teachers to be available to, to encourage them and to talk to them. And the reality of our life is to be found faithful. Listen, they took Jesus' word seriously. what they do? They took it seriously. Here's what James says in chapter 1, verse 22. Be ye doers of the word. Be ye, you have a command, be doer of the word. Not just read this Bible. And it's amazing how we patronize and really we do ourselves harm. I really enjoyed reading that passage of Scripture. Yeah, what did it do to you? Did it convict you? Did it soberly awaken you? These men literally took their Lord's word seriously. But not only that, expect a time of personal evaluation. Now, I want you to notice something in the text of Scripture. I want you to listen to it very, very carefully. Because in verse 19, I want you to listen. After a long time, the Lord of those servants come and reckon with them. After a long time, the Lord's going to come back. Amen? Think about it. He's going to come back. I've told you my infamous story of the, of the brick pile, how dad had gone and I went out to play. I didn't take his notes seriously. I didn't expect a time of evaluation. And I didn't expect him to call me on the carpet and literally let me know you're to do what I say. There was a time of evaluation. And here's what the world does to you and me. Listen carefully. The world tells us to play and to have fun and, and recreation. And there's nothing wrong with play and fun and recreation. But there is if you make it your life's business. It's a serious offense to God 
When we use this one God-given life, we're not worried about anybody else other than ourselves. We're not worried about anybody else hearing the gospel. We're not worrying about anybody else being discipled. We're not worried about pouring our life into somebody else. Do you realize that the disciples of Jesus Christ lived and died and breathed the gospel of God? It was a big deal to them. When you look in this text of Scripture, they expected a personal time of evaluation. So how do, I, how do I know that it's going to happen? Well, listen to what Psalm says. And I love the way it's put in the Living Bible. But listen to how the King James first. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of fire, purified seven times. In other words, the Living Bible puts it this way. The Lord's promise is sure. He speaks no careless words. All he says is pure as truth. Like silver, seven times refined. In other words, Benny, I'm going to be gone for a while, but I'm going to come back and evaluate you. I'm going to call you into account for every message that you preached. I'm going to call you into account for everything that you've done. I'm going to call you into account, and I long to give you reward. That's what these men knew. These men in this story, they were faithful. The Bible doesn't give any names. The Bible doesn't reveal. Jesus just gives these parables, but an uh, earthly story with a divine heavenly reality. And so when we live expecting evaluation, here's what we do. We guard what we believe. Isn't it amazing the world just tries to pull and tug at us? And now, it's not really important what you believe. It is eternally important what you believe. That's why this church and we will teach and preach nothing but the word of the living God. Because it does matter. Your soul matters. Your eternity matters. And how we treat others. Listen, that carries tremendous impact. What we do with our lives, what we do with our lips, what we do with our resources, what we do with our actions, what we do with our motivations, all of those will be evaluated. You see, have you ever done something with the purest of motives and it was misunderstood or missed of motives? You had the best of motivations. You had a heart's desire to honor God, to encourage others. God's going to look at our motives. And so these men, you know what they did? They expect a personal evaluation. Do you? Are you living this moment expecting that moment, that day, that time when you personally will be evaluated by Jesus Christ himself because it is coming? If you're not worth a good sign, you're not saved. Because the reality of it is there's a lot of pseudo-Christians that are not really authentic. But not only that, refuse to become sidetracked. Now notice the text of Scripture. If there's I don't know uh, much about Warren Buffett's history. I don't know very much about his life. I hear him in the news quite a bit. But I'm sure he has made it his... The Lord. They're not lazy. They're not slothful. And they don't allow that you may have obtained. Here's what Paul knew. Paul knew the reality of his life. He knew it was short. He knew it was brief at best. You know, if you're going to refuse to become sidetracked, here's what you have to do. You have to stay focused. Here's what is sidetracking so many. First of all, social media has a way of sidetracking us. Have you ever known a time that the people are disheartened and discouraged with the world government like they are now? Have we always had sinful governments? Yes. Have we always had a, a carnal world? Yes. But you know what's happening? People are being sidetracked. Now listen carefully. When you look in this text of Scripture, and when you look at somebody who has this earth's resources, they don't get sidetracked. Are you easily sidetracked? When these two men, the Bible says that the Lord came and he called them and, and, he, and he evaluated them. You know, the one with five gained five more, the one with two gained two more. I want you to go back and I want you to look in the text of Scripture what the Lord says to those men. After a long, long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckon with them. Now notice the word reckon. In other words, what they did was what they were rewarded for. Listen carefully. What you do or do not do, 
What is on your account status is what you'll be reckoned with. Whatever God sees to the asset or to the liability column of your life, because God's not going to compare you to me, me to somebody else, because you are the you that God made you, and God is going to reckon. Reckon really are mathematicians and any type of accounting. You know you have to, you know, reckon. And the Lord said, I'm scared to death. Why are you scared to death? Because it's and I have to confess, there's a long... Let me show you how, how horrible it would be. You and I know that not every person in the world has the same amount of money. Let's say if everybody had the same amount of money in this sanctuary, everybody's got $10,000 in their bank account, everybody's got $500,000 in their savings. Well, wouldn't that be nice? I remember when I was just a little boy, my dad, bless his heart, I'd go up to him and I'd say, Dad, can I have some money to go to the store? And I'd hear him scrounge around. And he really did. And he'd go deep, deep, deep in those pockets. And he'd come out with a nickel. Maybe I'd get a dime. If I got a quarter, it was shouting time. <laughs> and I'd go to my mother, bless her heart, she had nothing. But you know what? The reality of it is, he gave out of the resources of what he had. Now I want you to notice something. Look in the text. Look in verse 20. And he that had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered unto me five talents. Behold, I've gained five talents more. Watch what happens. His Lord said unto him, look at those next two words. Well done. Lord, why are you going to say, well done? He just had five talents because he used what he was given. He used what was given to his ability. And then the one with two, you know what ha happened. His Lord said unto him, well done. Now, why is that such a big deal? Because the reality of it is it's a picture of Jesus. Do you realize Jesus is not going to say, well done, if I'm not done well? I've heard people say this all of my life. I just want to hear the Lord say, well done. Do you understand Jesus utters no idle words? Whatever he commends you for will be for eternity. It won't matter for just a few days. You see, people who are rich on this earth, they're doing some good things to make money for the here and the now, but here's the problem. The here and the now is going to blow up someday by the word of the Lord. If I earn rewards eternally, they're going to be there and be there and be there. And it's things that I've done for Jesus. And you see, that's exactly what these men did. They refused to become sidetracked. What about you? Are you one that's sort of easily sidetracked? You say, well, you know what? The pretty, the glamour, the glitz. Can I tell you, the devil uses the pretty things of this world to challenge you. Are you going to go for the pretty? Are you going to go for the glamour? Are you going to go for the glitzy? And, you know, a lot of people are just like fish that are caught. You know what a good fisherman does? The devil's sort of like a good fisherman. He knows what bait to use where he is. And there's nothing wrong with money. There's nothing wrong with having a lot of money. It sure it does matter what your heart's motivation. But here's a fisherman, and he's fishing, and, and he's at a certain area, and he says, you know what? I can't use that bait. I can't use that bait. I can't. But here's the only bait that I found that works right here. And he puts it on his fishing line, and he puts it in, and sure enough, he comes up with a large fish, maybe a largemouth bass or smallmouth bass or something else he's fishing for. And somebody will come along and vary but say, buddy, how did you catch that? What was the bait you used? And you'll tell them what bait you used. Here's the reality. I want you to listen. You may not listen, but I'm going to say it. That way I'm not accountable for not saying it to you. The devil is using a bait on your life. He's using a bait. And guess what you're doing? You're falling for it hook, line, and sinker. I say this in love, but I must say it. Some of you won't even be around the church in 10 years. 
If you are, it'll be like once every five, six months, once a year. Some of you won't even be around the church five years from now. You know why? It's always the invariable phrase. I'm just so busy. You know what these two wise men knew? They were not too busy to invest their life, their energy, because they knew their Lord was coming. They knew their Lord was going to come back. You know, Paul knew that only one person received a prize. Sometimes I like to watch the uh, Olympic relays and when I get in on it. But there was a time I was watching and I happened to see, and I've told you this before, but they were running. I can't remember what was the particular race, but they got on their mark, got set, go, and the judge said fault, and one man jumped prematurely. And they did a second time, and he faulted the second time. Now listen carefully. The judge made him leave the race. I thought, how many years did that man run? How many miles has that man trained? How many mornings has he got up to run the race? And, and he did everything, and then he disqualified himself on the ultimate day when he was to run the ultimate race. Listen, your name is going to be called. You are going to stand before Jesus himself. You're going to stand personally. And you're going to listen. And there's probably going to be a lot of weeping because you're going to watch as things are burned up that you invested in this life. And you're going to realize, Lord, you did exactly what you said you was going to do. Today is my day of reckoning and I have not built wisely. Listen, if there's one thing these men knew and they did lastly, they refocused on the brevity of life. Let me ask all of us, no matter how young you are or old you are, don't you get amazed at how brief life is? I can't fathom in my mind, and this is personal, that my dad is gone. It just don't seem real. Now, dad lived a good long life, 95 years. Still, in my mind's eye, and you know what I'm talking about, Dad should be 32, 33 in my mind's eye, and I should be a little boy out there passing ball, and uh, he should be catching it, and, uh, you know, and how fast time goes. The Bible says in James 4.14, I want you to listen. For what is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. The Lord makes it very clear. Benny, whatever your name is, you're going to be here. It's like a vapor. I remember watching my mom cook and that pressure cooker and all those vapors, would, all of a sudden you'd see them and they'd be gone. And the reality is that's our life. We're here and then we're gone. Another generation, they're here and they're gone. The next generation, they're here and they're gone. Sometimes I like to watch intriguing old videos. And I saw one of the earliest videos in the, I guess it was the latter 1800s, New York City, the horse-drawn buggies, men walking with canes and all dressed to the nines, and little boys playing, and I thought all that generation is dead and gone. No matter how little they were, they're dead and gone. A man by the name of C.T. Studd, who was an English missionary to China, India, and Africa, wrote this following. And I hope you listen to it very well. Two little lines I heard one day traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. 
Then in that day my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Will last. And that when I am dying, how happy I'll be if the lamp of my life has been burned out for thee. Wouldn't you love to know you fought to the finish? You finished your course. And a time out there, the Lord calls you and he can honestly say about your life, well done. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the sobering conviction that we can gain reward by how we use our life and our time and our mouth and our motivations and how we express love toward the godly and the godless, how we love those who love us but also love those who don't love us and care anything about us, but we love them in the Lord and we pray for them. Father, we thank you so very much that this one life will soon be passed. But we do know that everything that's done for Christ, whatever it is, no matter how little, no matter how much, it will last. It will last the fire of your judgment. It will last the fire of this burning earth someday. Oh, blessed be your name. Father, I pray for that person or persons who needs to come to Christ this morning. I pray for that person who needs to move their life into this fellowship. Father, you have your will and your way. In Jesus' 